we're not going to do the introduction today because it doesn't feel right because we're going to talk about Grenfell Mm -hmm. Um, and we're going to talk about Grenfell in depth so if you are well if you don't feel like you can listen to that then maybe don't listen to this podcast but Mm -hmm. you probably should listen to it Um, Grenfell inquiry out today Mm -hmm. what were the key findings Laura well, the inquiry chair, uh, retired judge Martin Murbick, uh, summarised up um, the findings of the report and he blamed incompetence, greed and dishonesty of parties involved, including the council, the TMO, the government, the cladding contractors and subcontractors um, for deaths, for the 72 deaths, which he said were all avoidable. Um, he found that Quite damningly, he found that no one was prepared to take responsibility for having chosen the AMC cladding. Um, And when questioned, everyone who was asked said someone else was responsible for ensuring they were suitable. Um, In particular, he said that there was systemic dishonesty and deliberate and sustained strategies by manufacturers of cladding companies to make their products appear safe. He said that the companies involved in the refurbishment of the tower were incompetent He said the 2010 Conservative Liberal Democrat government was was strongly criticised for its focus on cutting regulation, which led safety matters to be ignored, delayed or disregarded. Um, He also found blame in Kensington and Chelsea Council, particularly for how they handled placement of residents after the fire. Um, And then finally, he found failings with the London Fire Brigade for having a strategy to evacuate the building once they'd lost control and and that they had an unfounded assumption that this type of blaze could not happen. Because that was the, that point there that you just spoke about with Kensington and Chelsea Council, that the issue of Kensington and Chelsea Council and their relocation programme was one that's mirrored across many of the people who were, um, I suppose, involved in the construction of the building um after in, in the days or in the wake of the Grenfell Tower fire it was the gaslighting mm-hmm. of the victims mm-hmm. or the people who had been trapped in the tower or the people who lived around the tower this report has found which we knew anyway but it's in black and white now for us that there was a, a long drawn out process in which basically various people passed the buck and what that meant was the people who'd suffered in that fire mm-hmm. were well, well, they were gaslit. Mm-hmm. I think that's something that came up through the Tenants Management Organisation, which were the group that were placed in charge of managing the building for the council. Residents had founded their own um, Grandfell Action Group before um, the tragedy happened in 2017, where they were raising consistently complaints with the council about fears and concerns of how safe the building was and fire safety within the building. Um, and they were threatened with a defamation suit by the council for mm. raising those those concerns. Yeah, I mean, that seems reasonable, doesn't it? It's, it's just, it's actually quite shocking um, just how callous and the, the residents were treated before and after mm-hmm. the, the fire. There was, um, I mean, a catalogue of events that led to that fire. Mm-hmm. Um, Rishi Sunak actually was very strong in it in the Commons just now. Uh, we just heard from him. Maybe we have a little clip here. Today's publication, as the Prime Minister said, is, to put it bluntly, a damning indictment of over 30 years of successive state failures. Stretching as far back as Knowsley Heights in 1991 and then multiple incidents from there, Sir Martin Morbick and the work of the inquiry have painted a picture of systemic indifference, failure, and in some notable cases, dishonesty and greed. Sir Martin and the team working on the inquiry are to be commended for the depth and rigour of their work. They're saying that cladding failures are a result of systemic dishonesty and greed. Mm -hmm. Systemic dishonesty. People putting profit over. The, The thing that really gets me about the Grenfell Tower fire is that the cladding was put onto that building, not to repair it, not because of any structural issue that the building had, but it was to beautify the building. It was an aesthetic choice. Mm -hmm. All of this tragedy is rooted in classism. This is because it was in a wealthy area of West London and it was potentially damaging the house prices 
of people who were living around it, buildings that were around that building because it was, quote unquote, an eyesore. Mm -hmm. And then so it was covered in this lethal packaging. It's shocking as well because the cost of of the better quality cladding, um, the difference for the, to do the whole building would only have been £5,000. £5,000 and seven, for 72 lives is... Mm -hmm. An, an inordinately small amount of money but they chose they chose to, to cut costs well let's talk about a few of the companies that have been named in the inquiry so there's mm -hmm. Arconic they are the company that make well made combustible cladding panels um, they actually in 2007 they went over and uh, to um, a consultant who showed them what would happen to this cladding if there were to be a fire or whether it you know what this cladding would do if it was in the presence of extreme heat and it showed that the lethal toxic smoke that was emitted by the cladding would kill people within two to three minutes. And the consultant said that around 60 or 70 people could die if there was a fire, which is eerily accurate. Then the next company is Kingspan, who made Celotex. That was about 5% of the combustible foam mm -hmm. that was inside the cladding. So when the fire started on one of the lower floors and spread... Uh, you know, almost you know, within minutes up to the top of the tower, it was because the cladding is essentially two pieces of material and inside it, it had flab flammable material and an air pocket, which basically meant the fire could travel at rapid speed mm -hmm. up the building. Tests of that, so it's K15, this uh, combustible foam that was inside of it, uh, showed that it, could, it was not safe in buildings that were above 18 metres. This company's dishonest dishonest marketing told firms that it was okay in mm -hmm. buildings above t uh, 18 meters which we've now shown mm -hmm. well it wasn't but, i mean that and um, amc cladding was banned on tall buildings in the u.s and germany at the time it was also it also wasn't used in scotland to the same extent because of planning and regulation laws so it is interesting to say that if these other states we're, we're banning it. Why, why wasn't it already banned in England on buildings over 18 metres? Mm -hmm. Why was it put on there in the first place? Central government have also been named as one of the peop uh, one of the groups that are culpable for this tragedy. There were two instances of combustible cladding leading to fires and deaths. One in uh, 2009, where six people were killed by burning cladding. Uh, and then all the way back in 1991, Knowsley Heights in Liverpool, there was a similar incident where this combustible cladding, mm -hmm. uh, well, created an uncontrollable blaze. And then the final group that I mentioned, I mean, there's, there's, there's you know, there's more than we could list on this podcast, but one of the, the groups that we thought we should mention is Studio E, which is now a defunct architectural firm. Mm -hmm. uh, they are named as uh, giving inadequate thoughts to fire safety. Mm. And uh, they recommend, well, they chose Arconic, which is the original cladding that we were speaking about, these panels that were on the outside of the building, because they were offered a good price. They'd had a previous relationship with Arconic. And so, and that's probably the £5,000 saving that you're talking about. Mm, yeah. Um, Studio E and Harley Facades, who were mentioned by uh, Martin Murbick, he called them incompetent and he said that none of their employees engaged on the project of refurbishing Grenfell understood the relevant provisions of building regulations which is quite damning and you mentioned the two incidents before Grenfell happened and we saw we saw what happened in Dagenham last week as well mm. and it's quite shocking that nearly 2,000 social housing blocks remain with um cladding like was in, was in, used in Grenfell mainly in England. Mm. I've got loads of friends who live in cladded buildings. Don't really? know about you, yeah. Um, yeah, and they've, uh, if you're, so this, this 18 meters is now really important because if you're in a certain story, then your house, you can now sell that flat again. You couldn't sell it for quite some time. You couldn't get a mortgage on a property mm -hmm. that had this dangerous cladding on it. If you're above those stories, you still can't. I, I don't know how people sleep in those buildings. No. There are buildings across the country where there is a dedicated fire warden mm -hmm. who walks around the building 24 7 to ensure that there isn't a fire i suppose we should talk about the criminality or we should actually just get keir starmer uh, we should listen into what mm -hmm. he's just said in the commons he finds that the work of the building research establishment was marred by unprofessional conduct inadequate practices a lack of effective oversight poor reporting and a lack of scientific rigor 
and that the Tenant Management Organisation must bear a share of the blame. Its only fire safety assessor, these are his words, had misrepresented his experience and qualifications, some of which he invented, and was ill-informed to carry out fire risk assessments on buildings of the size and complexity of Grenfell Tower. He also finds a chronic lack of effective management and leadership on behalf of the London Fire Brigade. With tragic consequences on the night of the fire. Mr. Speaker, in the light of such findings, it is imperative that there is full accountability, including through the criminal justice process, and that this happens as swiftly as possible. So, people are going to go to prison, Laura? It's interesting because I think that's the kind of overarching question is will charges be brought against whom? And also, how quickly will these charges be brought? Because I think the Met Police are expected to spend up to 18 months cons just considering the contents of the report before taking any further action and before any prosecutions will be brought, which would mean it could be 10 years before we see the first prosecution for Grenfell since the fire itself. It's a very long time to wait for justice if you're a victim or a family. Mm. The only slight um, reprieve in that is that uh, those people who know of their criminality will have the worst decade of, you know, of their lives waiting to be sent to prison. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people will go to prison for this? I, 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 I think it would be, um, I, I, I don't even have the words if mm -hmm. people don't go to prison for it. Mm -hmm. It's astonishing. Every time, every time we talk about Grenfell, it, it, I, I actually don't have the words to speak about it. I don't even know how to put it into words. The, Another thing that Keir Starmer was talking about was the stay put message. Yes. So, Keir, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Um, well, it, I think it was interesting because he was talking about how they've already, um, how he was talking about in Parliament the recommendations and how they're going to consider all 58 recommendations, but how some um, changes had, al had already taken place. And one of them was that they had changed the advising for fire and rescue services for large-scale incidents so they could easier move between stay put and evacuation. Mm. So basically the, the message now is get out. Mm -hmm. Those people who were told to stay in their flats, mm -hmm. I ca I, it, there was a transcript within this, the, the, the publication today, there are transcripts of the 999 calls that were made. There's this one call, and this is on, um, I think it was the 21st floor, it was a very high, it might have been the 20th floor, sorry. Uh, this male caller, he said, I'm, I'm going to read it and it's, it's awful. He said, he's on the phone to the emergency services. He said, we could have left a long time ago. We could have, but they said, stay in the flat, stay in the flat. We stayed in the flat and we didn't leave. The operator says, okay, just hold the line, please. I'm going to reconnect you to the fire service. You can hear a female screaming mum and then the male it, the mail caller is saying to the emergency services, please, please, please help us on the floor. We can't get out. Um, the operator says, have you finished your call with the fire service? The female caller is heard saying, I'm going to die in my house. I'm going to die because there's a fire. Oh my God, it's just awful, isn't it? It's so bad. The night that it happened, um, I was just starting work at a radio station and um, I know that people in the tower phoned that radio station um, and they were speaking to the people who operate the phones because they couldn't get any help from the emergency services. And so they, st I'm gonna start crying. They started, yeah. they started phoning the radio station to tell them like, please help us. My God, I can't, I can't stand it. It's really, yeah, it's, it's awful to imagine that that was the advice in place because it, it feels like it feels against common sense and they were operating under this sort of well they were operating under the assumption that the buildings were sufficiently insulated and sufficiently compliant with fire regulation service at uh, fire regulations which they clearly weren't but that was that was the assumption they were operating off of and it it does make you question why was that ever the case for for buildings that were as tall as that. And also if you look at the regulations on these tall buildings in Britain and how they, how they differ from the EU and US, it is, is quite 
interesting in terms of these buildings in Britain are only required to have one stairwell. In the US, you have to have two for fire to for evacuation. Um, in the US, they also are required to have sprinklers over a certain height, which isn't the case in the UK. And I guess it, it kind of poses the, the question of like, why why are we out of step with these other countries when it comes to fire fire safety regulations? Keir Starmer in the Commons was talking about the fire marshal as well, who had been uh, instructed to look after the building. And it seems that he had no qualifications or very limited qualifications in fire safety. And he'd actually even fabricated certain, guy, you know, uh, qualifications that he had. Uh, all of it is just that there are no words to speak mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. I remember that night, like do, if you lived anywhere in the vicinity of West London, like if you were in like, I was in South West London and you could just see the smoke and it was there for days. This, this, this huge cloud of smoke was above all of that area of London for maybe a, about a week and you could smell it. You could smell the building. It was, um, what I don't understand is going back to this, these tests that are conic, Uh, put the cladding through that moment when that consultant explained to them that this this cladding is so combustible the the the, it was so poisonous that it could kill people within two to three minutes how on earth that cladding ever even made it out of that test room let alone made it onto a building Mm -hmm. how did that happen Mm -hmm. all to save cash and to make a building look slightly more aesthetically pleasing yeah it's it's like an it's like an indictment of like of how we treat like the most vulnerable in our society and it's it's like awful yeah yeah Mm. and and the the community who lived in that area so spent quite a long time a good few weeks after that outside the Grenfell Tower reporting or well I was actually producing so I was gathering in, um, information I was talking to a lot of people who lived in the area it was smoking for a good I would say a good month mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. it was smoking for a really long time mm-hmm. and people were living next to it the buildings are really close to each other mm-hmm. so people were people's living rooms or kitchens were looking at that tower and then those the children in that area, there was a school there. Um, those children were relocated, but they had to go home and look at this building that was smoldering. And then this is in September now, you know this, you know, or the building that was essentially a huge grave. Mm-hmm. They didn't cover it for a really long time, basically, so you could see into the building. And those children had to keep going about their daily lives. Mm-hmm. I, it's astonishing. I mean, it's been something that. Um, Grenfell for Justice have been highlighting um, consistently is the continuing effects on the residents who now no longer live there or have been relocated but have to live every day with the impacts of that on their life whether that's through PTSD or um, dealing with the loss of a loved one and they've highlighted the effects especially on young children but also um, I know that the London Fire Brigade as well have been speaking about the effects um, on the mental health of their um, their fire and rescue team as well. There's that really astonishing video, isn't there, where they're driving over the flyover to get to Grenfell. So, like, if you don't know West London, there's the Westway, which is basically a road that runs. Uh, you can see Grenfell Tower for like a good couple of minutes while you're driving on it, and the fire brigade, one of the uh, one of the trucks, was driving along it. And it's the moment where the blaze starts to climb up the building and you can you can hear it in all of their voices. They actually cannot comprehend what they're looking at. Mm-hmm. It's it's tragedy doesn't begin to cover what happened that night. It's you have to be very careful what you say, don't you? Because it's going, there's going to be criminal proceedings and there's an inquiry. Mm-hmm. But I would say tragedy doesn't do it justice. No. And clearly as... as- the report finds, you know, incompetence, greed and dishonesty. They're not, it's not an accident that that happened. It was systemic failings. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's blame with, with people. Mm-hmm. Right. 
I think we've covered that. Yeah. Prime Minister's questions. Prime Minister's questions, not... Um... He started with Grenfell, didn't he? He did, and he he gave... A f- after Prime Minister's questions, he gave a full, a full response to Grenfell, and he gave... He started with an apology on, on behalf of the, the British state and promised to um, address the recommendations from the report, looking at all 58 in detail. So, Mr Speaker, I want to start with an apology on behalf of the British state to each and every one of you, and indeed to all of the families affected by this tragedy. It should never have happened. The country failed to discharge its most fundamental duty to protect you and your loved ones, the people that we are here to serve. And I am deeply sorry. So, yes, he opened up. I want to... That apology on behalf of the British state, it's very strong. Um, That is... Do you remember when Theresa May went to... Grenfell, the day after, was it the day after or a couple of days after that it happened? My God, do you remember, like, all, I, I, looking back on it, it's absolutely astonishing what happened in the days after that. The lack of, I, it almost felt that her administration felt that they wanted to distance themselves from it as far away as they could. She wasn't quick to act there should have been an immediate relocation process for everyone who was in that area. You're in London. You can put people up in hotels mm. instantly, and it didn't happen. Mm. Remember, I think Adele got there before mm-hmm. Theresa May did, and Theresa May was obviously Home Secretary before that. Do you remember when Stormzy was that? Was it the Brit Awards? And he said, "Where's the money for Grenfell?" Yeah, yeah. Never came, did it? And I think that it's something that. Um, Judge Martin Murbick pointed out um, is that where the state and where councils and where local authorities were failing, the, that gap was filled by community and community organisations. And he um, specifically highlighted their um, provision of rest centres and assistance to those in need. I think there was definitely a sense from the beginning that there was criminality involved in what had happened because I remember speaking to MPs in the area and council leaders and specifically the MP for Kensington and Chelsea and I remember her saying well I wasn't the MP when this was you know put on I wasn't the MP who was involved in the decision making it's like this is the establishment knew from the get-go that there was criminality involved in it and wanted to distance themselves from it and instead of acting in a way that was um, that you should in the aftermath of an emergency, which is, what can I do for these people? It was, but this isn't my fault. Yeah. Which is a really odd way to respond to something that's just happened. Mm-hmm. In any other tragedy that's happened in the UK, do you hear an MP immediately saying, well, this is nothing to do with me? Mm. When you had that tragedy in Southport a few weeks ago, was the local MP up on a podium shouting, well, I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. It is part of the the culture of buck passing, which was highlighted in in the inquiry, I think. Mm. Okay. Arms export licences. Should we hear that? Yes. Pensioners, in order to give it to highly paid train drivers, that is a choice that he has made, and it will be clear to any pensioners watching that he simply can't explain why he has made that choice. But, Mr Speaker, turning to another important issue. The government has suspended 30 of the UK's 350 arms export licences to Israel. It's a decision that the chief rabbi says beggars belief and will encourage our shared enemies. Can the Prime Minister therefore explain how his decision will help to secure the release of the 101 hostages still being held by Hamas? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, can I start by saying I think the whole House will be shocked by the horrific killing of six hostages in the last few days. And I know I speak for the whole House when I say that. The remaining hostages... So that follows on from David Lammy yesterday, the Foreign Secretary announcing that uh, 
th- oh no, sorry, two days ago now, that mm-hmm. 30 of the 350 arms export licenses to Israel have been suspended because there was a clear risk uh, that the equipment could be used to commit serious violations of international law. Mm. I think this is really interesting because it's quite unusual for the British state to take an alternative line or diverge from American foreign policy and the American foreign policy line. And the National Security Council said that they haven't determined, the US hasn't determined that there'd be a violation to international law and that's their reason for not suspending um, arms export licences. Um, and Rishi, and I think this is also where we see not just the divergence from the Labour government from the US foreign policy line, but also a divergence on this issue from the last government as well, because Rishi Sunak was saying that it was essential we maintain transatlantic unity, making it quite clear that he wouldn't have taken this decision if, if he was still in government. Um, and it's, it's also not the first that we've seen a diverging move from the Labour government because they restored funding to um, the UNRWA agency for Palestinian refugees and they dropped opposition to the International Criminal Court arrest warrant for Netanyahu. So I, a lot, obviously a lot of people still don't think this goes far enough, but it is quite different from what the previous Conservative government were pursuing on this issue. When David Lammy was Shadow Foreign Secretary, he was pushing David Cameron, who was Foreign Secretary at the time, to publish the, um, publish the findings, mm-hmm. um, which David Cameron refused. Also, it was made very difficult by the fact that David Cameron is a lord, and so he was never in the House of Commons. He couldn't be questioned at the dispatch box. And that might sound quite um, trivial. That might seem like a little procedural, but actually it's... You know, Parliament is pretty much the only place where you can, as a politician, you cannot lie. You mm-hmm. you have to, um, you have to speak truthfully. <laughs> Sorry, I'm saying it. It's like, <laughs> do they? <laughs> but anyway, he wasn't. He wasn't. Lammy couldn't hold Cameron to account because mm-hmm. he couldn't be called uh, to the House of Commons chamber. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the first day that he arrived in the Foreign Office, this was the one of the first things that he did was commissioned this report. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this is the findings. Absana Begum was very interesting on it, wasn't she? What did she say? She's now a suspend. She's now suspended from the Labour Party, so she's technically an independent MP. She was suspended over... The, two the two-child child policy. Benefit. Yeah, she yeah. voted against... No, she voted for lifting the mm-hmm. two-child benefit cap. Mm-hmm. Um, she was in the Commons on Monday and she asked... David Lammy, if 30 of them have been found, that's not even 10% of the total number of arms export licenses. Mm -hmm. What happened to the rest of them? Mm -hmm. I think his argument was that um, a lot of it is they're not necessarily offensive weapons, but they're still providing the F-35 fighter jets. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what you use a fighter jet for if it's not to be offensive. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't really know a lot about Mm -hmm. military equipment. Those are the... Like, like Absana Begum was saying, that that's the question. What what was the, the what was it that made them find these thirty in violation and and the rest not? Mm. And ha- also, how can you guarantee that what they would be used for and what they wouldn't be used for once they've been exported? Rishi Sunak's argument today during Prime Minister's questions was that um, not only did he well, he was asking him, did you contact the international community? And he mm-hmm. also said, what sort of message? Sorry, I'm paraphrasing, but what sort of mm-hmm. message does this send to um, Hamas um, who have currently, and the hostages that are still um, in Gaza? His argument was that this sort of disincentivizes them mm. from releasing them, mm. that it sends quite a strong diplomatic message mm. to Palestine and to Israel. Mm. It's interesting seeing that, I guess, in the, in the context of what what's been happening in Israel and the protests against the Netanyahu government and the anger at Netanyahu's strategy for releasing the hostages from his own population who are very angry that he hasn't managed to to broker a deal and um, to mm. get the hostages back it you can every time you can see Starmer doesn't like do you know when Rishi Sunak said to him oh um what sort of message does this send to a country that should have the right to defend itself? Mm-hmm. He was, Starmer hates that line of questioning. Mm. There is The day after October 7th, when he said that Israel had the right to cut off water, 
that line has never been forgotten. Mm -hmm. And you can see it mm -hmm. every time he gets prompted to talk about Israel's mm -hmm. right to defend its, uh, defend herself. Is that what you say? Herself, don't you? Rather than itself. I don't know. Um, you can see the panic in mm -hmm. his eyes. It's interesting because when he was responding to that point, I think he was making, he said that this isn't a policy decision. This is a legal decision. Mm. He was very much trying to take the stance of the neutrality of the law, I felt, rather than saying this is, this is our opinion. It was very much, this is, this is legally objective mm. in violation. We can't give them these export licenses. Is there anything else you want to say about that? No, should we do the next clip? Yeah. To the hard work, bravery and dedication of our police. This summer, in challenging circumstances, they served our communities commendably and kept us all safe. Yeah. Now, Mr Speaker, government is about making choices, and the new Prime Minister has made a choice. He has chosen to take the winter fuel allowance away from low-income pensioners and give that money to certain unionised workforces in inflation-busting pay rises. So can I just ask the Prime Minister, why did he choose train drivers over Britain's vulnerable pensioners? Yeah. Mr Speaker, this government was elected to clear up the mess left by the party opposition and to bring about the change that the country desperately needs. This is news that train drivers are expected to receive a 14% pay increase. Um, the Telegraph wrote it up as the RMT's Mick Whelan. I thought that was quite good. <laughs> Mick Whelan doesn't work for the mm. RMT. No, not really. <laughs> um, he also said, did you thought it was interesting that... Um, the Tories have started using the phrase choice. Yes. It's like, wait, why didn't you, you completely uh, ignored mm. that? Um, I can't think, what, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. You never said that when you were in government, mm. this idea of choice. Mm -hmm. but he's like, you've chosen the pensioners, the train drivers over the pensioners. It's so interesting because I feel like choice and hard choices and tough choices, that's Labour's favourite thing to say mm. and it was interesting when Rishi Sunak was framing that as a choice between uh, universal winter fuel allowance and setting the strikes and that was he said you had, you had choice between these two things and then Starmer rebutted that with no that's wrong I had a choice between universal winter fuel allowance and filling the 22 billion pound black hole the conservatives left um, but I mean it is a choice to cut winter fuel allowance but I don't necessarily think it's a choice between that either um, the two that either of them are framing it as, because there's Rishi, uh, Keir Starmer is saying that he had that between those two. Um, but it's interesting because I think it's a choice to stick to the arbitrary fiscal rules on borrowing and debt, which he doesn't seem to think he has a choice in doing um, because he wants to be seen as being economically responsible and interestingly that was the same reason that Labour gave for ditching the 28 billion pounds on green investment mm. um, but like as a lot of economic uh, think tanks have pointed out is these these fiscal rules it's a choice to stick to them they are quite arbitrary and um, we know that uh, sticking to them which is essentially austerity didn't actually hasn't done much to boost growth in the last 12 years um, and it's interesting because another choice he could consider is that raising capital gains tax equal with income would raise an extra 10 billion for the economy, whereas mm. cutting winter fuel allowance only saves 1.5 billion. Do you know what I found astonishing? I was talking, t talking, talking to Sir Anthony Selden yesterday, who's just written, uh, he's just uh, done a biography on Liz Truss. Do you know that Liz Truss created a 72 billion pound black hole with that mini budget? Mm. I don't know why that, that, that number hasn't been at the forefront of my mind for the past few, 72 billion pounds. That is absolutely astonishing. Mm -hmm. That's where the line came out about, um, do you know that Liz Truss um, contemplated cutting cancer treatment on the NHS uh, to save money? Mm -hmm. Anthony, yes, Sir Anthony yesterday was explaining that that was because the, uh, the Treasury essentially put these options in front of her. Mm -hmm. They were so desperate. The mm -hmm. entire country was about to collapse. Mm -hmm. I know that we, we knew we were on the brink and we were days away. But when you put it like that, £72 billion, pounds, what the... <laughs> what was she doing? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it makes you question, like, how... Because how, I know that um, it was also at that point in the, in the book when he's talking, he's saying that... Um, they were struggling to get through to not just Liz Trust, but also Quasi Quartang, just mm. the absolute dire straits they were in. And they, they said, we couldn't get it through to them. And it's 
quite unbelievable that someone, two people in charge, Chancellor and the Prime Minister, couldn't fathom the situation they were in. They just didn't get it. But even then, they didn't cut the winter fuel payments. They didn't. (laughs) So it is a choice. It is a choice. But then I suppose that's a political choice, isn't it? I think it's overly simplistic to argue that um, the Conservatives go for pensioners and therefore they didn't cut the winter fuel allowance. I think Mm. it's too simplistic. I actually wonder if they just hadn't thought about it. (laughs) That would seem more likely. (laughs) Do you think... um, it's interesting because Sunak was really, you know, framing himself and the Conservatives as, um, as as the defenders on this issue. But around 1.6 million pensioners um, who live below the poverty line would be set or are set to lose the fuel, uh, the winter mm. fuel allowance. Um, Starmer's response when that was br- uh, brought up was that there's about 800,000 who aren't claiming pension credit, so therefore would be eligible for winter fuel allowance, and they're going to make sure those people are are claiming the credit, but that still leaves another 800,000 people below the poverty line without winter fuel allowance. Also, how do you make sure, this is the bit that I don't really understand how they work out the costings of things, because surely it's more expensive to engage in means testing or rigorous means testing um, and to advertise to pensioners what benefits they are eligible for Mm -hmm. than it is to cut it in the first place. They're sort of moving around Mm -hmm. because, you know, when the system moved over to universal credit from other various different um, welfare that you could claim, it was ex- it, it was extremely expensive mm-hmm. for the exchequer because you suddenly got to have all of these call centres, you've got to provide lots of literature. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds very trivial, but it's actually really expensive to print leaflets and mm-hmm. to send those out to people. Mm-hmm. Is it actually cost effective to cut the thing in the first place? Mm. And I wonder how many of those 80, 800,000 would be reached as well because they don't make it simple to apply yeah. for these benefits. It's um, a really long form. It's a really long form. And also a lot of it is online as well. And not every pensioner is, is online mm. or has someone to help them access online. And someone's also got to be... The, well, this that's where community picks up, isn't it? That's when charities start picking up. Like Age UK does work on that, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Again. But again, it's... That's a cost. <laughs> yeah. And again, relying on local community to step in for gaps in government and which local authority. Which is very authority. austerity. It's very austerity. Yeah. Austerity <laughs> coded that, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yes, it's a choice to continue the austerity budget. <laughs> Jacob Rees-Mogg was very excited about food banks, wasn't he, at one point? He said that it was a, you know, display of community. It's insane. It's good that, isn't it? Yeah, it's insane. Mm. Oh, I love, I love a good food bank, you know, it really brings the people together. Nothing brings a community together like shared hunger. Mm, well, it's big society, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> You're a fan of that, aren't you? No. (laughs) Should we um, add in just one more bit? Your mate, Pete Wishart. Oh, my God. Yeah. (laughs) After 14 miserable years of the worst Tory government in modern times, the best this Prime Minister can offer the British people is things can only get worse. Well, for him and his calamitous opinion ratings, that's probably true. But why does he think he has such an unprecedented fall in his popularity? Is it his attacks on the pensioners? Is it leaving children in poverty? Is it the re-emergence of Labour cronyism? Or is it because his austerity is even worse than the Conservative variety? I remember when they used to sit here. It's a, lo- it's a long way up and there's very few of them, so I don't think we need lectures on popularity. <laughs> That's Pete Wishart there arguing that we're in austerity 2.0. He actually says that austerity under Starmer is worse than it was under the Conservatives, which the point stands because we've already had 14 years Hmm. of de facto austerity, even though, you know, the the policy never ended Mm -hmm. because funding wasn't... um, so, you know, private, public services didn't suddenly receive a huge uplift in mm-hmm. spend capability. So mm-hmm. austerity never actually ended. So 14 years on from all of those cuts, if nothing's been reinstated and you're adding more cuts on top of it, that is quite a fair point. Austerity will be worse under this government than it has been previously. Mm-hmm. And, if, and if we're talking about choices, it's, again, a choice to stick to those fiscal rules. It's a choice not to borrow to invest. And... Um, so it's a choice to maintain austerity, even though I think the Labour government would very much like to frame it like there, there is no choice. This is the only way we can do it. 
Um, whereas I'm not so sure that's that's accurate. Mm. You got anything else to add, Laura? No. <laughs> well, sorry that it wasn't a very yeah. fun episode. Yeah, that was quite a heavy episode. Yeah, sorry about that. Ollie mm-hmm. and Ed will be back on Monday. Yeah, dudes rock. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>